Group work can be an excellent way to engage students in an online course. When effectively implemented, students working in groups or teams can foster critical thinking and dynamic interaction in an online environment. So in this workshop, we'll explore some different types of group structures, identify the benefits and challenges of group work, and discuss how to set up groups <coughs> online. I'll be your presenter today. My name is Amanda Smothers, and I'm the teaching and learning coordinator and sharing responsibilities of the online learning coordinator with uh, Dan Cabrera, who's actually here today in the session, um, in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. I'll be taking questions throughout and at the end of the presentation. So if you have specific questions related to what we're covering during the presentation, you can feel free to post them to the chat thread and I can address them as they come up or you can save them. I um, reserve some time at the end of the presentation here today to answer any questions that anybody wants to uh, discuss. So in the text chat, um, let's get to know who you all are. Uh, tell us your department, your division, your role. Explain what you hope to get out of this workshop. Um, and I think everybody has entered their, their names. Um, but if you don't have your first name um, entered when you logged in, then make sure that you mention who you are as well. And to get to the, the chat, you just click on that little speech bubble that's in the collaboration, the collaborate panel, the little orange icon in the lower right corner. All right, responses are starting to come in. We've got a, a nice variety here, some nursing, sociology, KNPE, um, poli-sci, marketing, communicative disorders. Comms, music, French. Great, and you can keep posting there to the chat um, with your introductions. And then I want you to put something else to the chat, to the chat, just a little bit of a check-in. How are you today? Just share an emoji in the chat. Um, there's a little emoji icon right below the Say Something box. You can click on that. You can search for emojis. Um, you can click on a category above, or you can just scroll through them and share an emoji that kind of ex explains how you're feeling. Nice, Colin. Okay, and great, we've got some emojis filing in here, um, as well as some goals. Uh, some of you would like to know how to better design group discussions, breakout projects, um, more effective group work, asynchronous group work, um, talking about breakout rooms and synchronous sessions as well. I feel you, Gibson, that is also, if I shared a second emoji, what my emoji would be. All right, so you can keep on sharing those emojis or those in introductions um, to yourself. And I will move on to our workshop objectives. So as I mentioned, group work can be an excellent way to engage students in an online course. Um, and when effectively implemented, students' group work can foster critical thinking 
It can foster dynamic interaction in the online learning environment. Um, so again, in this workshop, we're going to discuss how to use group work in synchronous and asynchronous settings. So um, that kind of touches on, I think, a few of the things that people are looking for. Uh, employ different types of group structures. So what is what is the ideal group structure look like? Um, and the rules for that. Um, identify some benefits and challenges of group work as well. And then navigate how to set up some groups online. We'll look at a, a little bit of an overview of some technology tools or just tools in general that we can use um, with group work online. So we'll start with the positive. Um, why group work? Why would we want to use group work in our classes? Group projects can be great learning activities or they can be disastrous depending on how they're set up. The most important thing about developing group work is that the group work has purpose and is organized. The students and the instructor should have the same understanding of the objectives of the group work and how to get it done. So some reasons that you might have for assigning group work, um, it provides experience with essential skills. Um, so collaborative skills, including effective communication in an online environment. Um, and as we've seen throughout the pandemic, I think work life may be changing because of all of this work from home. And so that online, the ability to interact with people and collaborate online is gonna be very important um, once our students enter the workforce. Um, so these, these are essential skills for workplaces, especially these days. Um, and group work can also help develop critical thinking and problem solving skills, as well as creativity, collaboration, and communication. Group work also provides opportunities for social and active learning. Students are able to engage with their classmates, connecting, sharing, and collaborating with one another. And social connection is just as much a benefit as academic achievement is, uh, especially in an online course uh, where you're not meeting face to face, um, you know, and everybody can feel kind of distant and, and alone in that online learning environment, even if, you know, you have synchronous sessions or if it's completely asynchronous, there can still be that bit of a disconnect. So you can use group work uh, to help create connections and uh, the, those social, social connections for students that they otherwise might not get. Um, and, and then I mentioned active learning as well. Active learning is also a benefit of purposeful planned group activities. Uh, approaches to group work like peer instruction, peer grading, and interactive learning help students take ownership of their learning experiences. Group work um, or group activities can fall into one of three basic categories. Uh, the first is there's no right answer. So this could be debates or research on complex issues. Um, it could be an activity where you look at multiple perspectives, such as analyzing current events or cultural comparisons or case studies. Um, and then another category might be that there's too many resources on a particular topic for one person to evaluate. So you might, for example, use a jigsaw puzzle approach with each student responsible for one part, and then they have to come together and teach each other about those parts so that they have a complete understanding. So I'll give you a few examples of group work activities. Um, and these are learning activities that you can use in face-to-face -face classrooms, but they are also uh, helpful with online learning too. Um, so one is discovery learning. And that type of work involves presenting some sort of novel, some sort of new to students situation, a set of observations to explain, um, or an open-ended question for students to explore in, in a more self-directed way. And then you would provide guidance throughout that process, throughout that group process. Um, another type of uh, activity that you could use with groups would be guided design. So that would involve leading groups of, of students through a complex sequence of steps, for example, to solve a real-world problem. Um, you'd provide feedback at each of those steps to make sure that they're on the right track and they're, they're going through them in the intended way. Um, and steps could include defining a situation, stating the problem and goal, generating ideas, and then selecting what the best one might be, um, and then defining the new situation that would result when that goal or that idea is implemented. Um, and then they would prepare a plan to implement that idea. Um, you might even be able to go so far as actually implementing that plan, depending on how far you want to go with that, um, and then evaluating and learning from the success or failure of the process. 
another strategy would be team-based learning. Um, so you would ask students to complete an initial set of, of tasks. Then they would take a short test, a multiple choice test that measures their understanding of those concepts, underlying the tasks. So they're starting off the work individually and then they're meeting into a meeting within groups. So after they take that test individually, they meet in their assigned groups, discuss the questions, reach consensus on the answers, uh, and then both the students' individual scores and their team scores are recorded and factored into their grade for the course. Um, another strategy is authentic learning. And that might involve the instructor choosing a problem that has no correct answer and requires investigation and collaboration. So the student groups may or may not be given a list of resources. You might want to, you know, depending on the level of, of experience of your group or the level of the course, um, you might want to give them a list of resources. But then they should also conduct their own research. Um, and then students engage with each other, making choices, evaluating competing solutions, potential solutions, and then creating the finished product as a group. And then the final um, group work activity that I'll mention is problem-based learning. So with that method, open-ended problems are introduced, uh, and then you're, you use them to provide, provide context for whatever learning is going to follow. Um, instead of teaching students what they need to know and then posing problems, you begin with the problem that determines what students will study. So this is the problem they need to solve through studying. Um, and the problems derive from either observable events, um, which students come to understand as they learn about those underlying theories. So, um, so it's a problem first learning or problem based learning. So there are challenges to group work, which you may have, you know, if you've used group work, especially at, online, but even face to face, there are challenges. Um, but particularly with online group work, there are some unique challenges. There are many reasons why students don't like group work. You may find, you know, that sigh or that rolling of the eyes or oh, I don't want to do group work when you announce the group activity or the group project. Um, and in the online classroom, the list of reasons for why students don't like group work grows even longer um, as the asynchronous nature of online courses makes collaboration even more difficult. Um, even if you have some synchronous sessions, you know, it's not quite the same as being face to face in the classroom. Um, so there might be, in addition to maybe students being resistant to the group work idea, there might be another issue at play that we haven't really thought about or we, we didn't consider, and that is how the group work is designed in the first place. So often we give students an activity and we call it group work when really it's something that they could just do on their own. And then we get irritated, and I'm guilty of this too, we get irritated when students end up doing the work on their own they just work individually instead of actually working together on it. So we don't want to make an activity group work just for the sake of having group work. A group activity has to be designed specifically for groups. There needs to be a purpose for activity being done in groups, not just, you know, I want to have a group project. This they could do on their own, but I'm going to assign them to do it in groups. Like there needs to be a purpose more so than you want to have group work. Um, so what is the purpose of this particular activity? being done in groups. And then moreover, online group work poses challenges for faculty and students for many reasons, including differing technology skills, whether that's a difference between technology skills of us as faculty or as students um, or between students themselves. Students have differing levels of technology skill as well. Um, differences in team member participation is another challenge um, or lack of participation by some group members. Um, and then logistics issues like time, scheduling conflicts. When are students going to meet in their groups? You know, is synchronicity a requirement for your group work? Um, and then finally, in online environments, it can take more, just more time to coordinate group tasks and divide responsibilities among the group. So something that might have just, you know, been able to be put together in a class, uh, in the classroom, in one class session, you know, might take a week in an online environment just to coordinate everything and get it set up. So synchronous group work, um, you know, you might 
think mostly of synchronous group work as being our synchronous classes. So maybe we have breakout rooms with specific goals uh, for that breakout room. So we send our students to the breakout rooms to do you know, group discussion or to do an in-class activity during our synchronous session. Um, and maybe we pop around to the different breakout rooms and maybe it's going well, maybe it's not going well. Um, some challenges uh, or some things that we need to think about when we're using breakout rooms um, are, do students really know what they're supposed to be doing? Um, and is there enough time for them to do that in that breakout session? Um, so I was talking to some students, some graduate students of mine who were talking about their experiences with um, online learning as learners. Um, and, you know, they mentioned breakout rooms. They don't like breakout rooms because, you know, it, there's varying levels of success. Um, but, you know, some of the common complaints are, you know, we get the instructions in the main room and then we go to the breakout rooms and we don't have any instructions anymore. So I, we don't remember what we're supposed to be doing. So, you know, we want to have when we use breakout rooms, we want to have specific goals. We might want to have worksheets, maybe in a sh in SharePoint um, or a shared folder uh, or prompts to guide students collaboration to guide their activity within um, their groups and it might be helpful too to get them to feel more comfortable um, they don't have to get over that initial shyness at the beginning of the breakout session um, with interacting with their peers who they're you know very divided from with being in, in different places with the online learnings um, you know you might want to put them in the same group every time so that they're already familiar, they've already worked with each other. Um, so that's one thing, um, is making sure that students know, know what they're supposed to be doing, um, and then using that purposefully. Um, so what is the purpose of going into breakout rooms? Uh, make sure that that's clear to students and clear to you when you're designing that activity. Um, something else that you might not consider or might not think of when you're thinking of synchronous group work is just sync students working synchronously on their own. So you put students into a group, uh, they have a group activity or a group project, and they need to coordinate their schedules and meet in either Collaborate or Teams or Zoom uh, synchronously amongst themselves without you being there. Um, so that's another another uh, thing to think about with synchronous group work. Are you going to require students actually meet together synchronously and how are they supposed to do that? How can you facilitate that effectively? Um, so you can set up, you know, a collaborate session for each one of your groups that they can go into whenever they need to and schedule their group meetings so that they can talk face to face in that way. Uh, Dan? Yes, Amanda. Um, in uh, Blackboard, when you create groups um, um, or teams or whatever, uh, one of the features is that each group or team has its own collaborate uh, session. So they can work independent. They go in as the um, a moderator. Uh, so they have you know full control over all the things that they need to instead of you having to go in and, and, and change their status while they're in the session. It's already established at the beginning uh, that each individual in a team has that uh, has that ability for their group uh, collaborate session. It's a nice it's a nice feature. I don't know how setting up things for Microsoft Teams or Zoom would be. Um, and it's not to say that you know that they don't. I'm sure that they do, but I just don't know how that would happen though. Um, and you're talking about uh, Blackboard original course view, right? Because that's a, that has a more robust groups feed more robust groups features yes. than yes. Ultra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, definitely. So that's one of the benefits of creating groups, uh, setting groups up using the groups feature in um, Blackboard Collaborate Original uh, course view is that they have their own area. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Um, you know, with Teams, you would need to know Blackboard Ultra doesn't. And I'll, I'll talk about the differences between those two in a minute. Um, I will get to that. Um, but no problem. Um, but yeah, so with Teams or Zoom, you would have to set up, you know, so they would have to coordinate with you to set up um, their meetings with that from within the classroom. Um, but they, they do have, I'm not sure what their, what their 
what they have with Zoom. I don't think they have as much freedom with Zoom, but I think that they can create team. You can create teams for them. So you can create a channel um, or a team and teams, and then you can add them to that. So you can create one for each group. Um, so there's different options. I think teams, I'm more familiar with how you would do that than I am with, with a Zoom. I think there's a little bit more, um, more ways that you can do that with teams. Well, I, I know that uh, with Zoom, since uh, students aren't authenticated users, it's a little bit more difficult to do it, I think. Yeah, and it's and Zoom is Zoom is kind of difficult too with the co-host, uh, alternate host have don't have as many um, permissions right. uh, or abilities as the host who sets up the meeting. Um, so you know, Zoom might not be the best option unless you're using that for your class and you're really familiar with it and you know how to set that up. Um, but Teams has a little bit more freedom with mm -hmm. that. Um, so if someone's in the team, they can start. A team call they can you know click that icon and start that so if you add them then you know they have a lot of freedom in there um, so asynchronous group work and asynchronous online class courses or in the asynchronous uh, component of your online course you may have some synchronous sessions as well students don't have class meetings um, in fully asynchronous online courses where they can exchange ideas divvy up those responsibilities or maybe you know, you do have synchronous sessions, but you want them to do that on their, their own um, and you don't want to take away class time for them to do that. So as a result, we want to make sure that those students have their own group workspaces, um, for example, like a group discussion board to connect with one another asynchronously. So you want to encourage your classes groups to connect, um, ideally before the assignment process begins. So for example, you could design an icebreaker for them to complete so that they can get to know one another before they begin the collaboration process and maybe that will make things go a little bit smoother. And then finally, with all, all group work online, you want to follow some specific steps to prepare for and implement your online group projects and those steps are preparation, um, considering the activity or the assignment, looking at the technology and evaluation. So to prepare for your group work, Make sure that students understand the value of the process and product of the group work. Um, so make sure that that they understand why this is, needs to be group work and that they value that process and product. That students have guidance from you on how to work in an asynchronous online group. That the group size is small enough to allow for full participation and to avoid members relying on others to carry the project weight. And that you provide numerous opportunities for community building before the project begins so that they are a team when they come together to do that teamwork. <laughs> when you're designing the assessment or the activity, we want to make sure that the assignment is an authentic measure of student learning. So what are our goals? What are our objectives with this activity, this assessment? Also make sure that the assessment or the activity will benefit from collaborative work. So it's not just group work for group work's sake. This activity will benefit from that collaborative nature of group work. Uh, that students have clear guidelines of your expectations. That the assignment creates a sense of positive interdependence, wherein group members perceive that they will succeed when the group succeeds. So they're dependent on each other. And that you allow adequate time for preparation and communication. So that time factor is going to be very important. Make sure that your students have enough time uh, for preparation and communication. And then when considering technology that will be used, ensure that you provide students with adequate options for tools and instructions to facilitate their online communication. Also make sure that each group has their own collaborative workspace in the online course. Um, as was mentioned, and I'll mention it again in, in I think on the next slide or the slide after that, um, you know, that collaborative workspace is built into when you create groups in uh, Blackboard Collaborate old, uh, Original View or Blackboard Original View, sorry. Um, but you may need to do a little bit more work if you're using Ultra Course View or if you want them to have different, uh, different experience, a different collaborative workspace. Um, and then also make sure that students have technology skills that are relevant for asynchronous communication. And if not, that they have the support and resources to facilitate their growth in that area. So what are the, what are the tools that they need? 
um, how are you going to get those tools to them if they don't have them? Um, so, and by tools, I mean the skills. So are you going to have maybe a section of your course that's, you know, a folder with resources? Um, are you going to cover that in a synchronous class or, or an asynchronous recorded lecture? Um, how are you going to give them the, su the support and the resources that they need to succeed in this uh, project? And then also make sure with technology that you have backup plans to deal with any technology issues or failures. And then the final component is evaluation uh, or assessment of the actual group work. So great when you're evaluating group work, ensure that your grading or your evaluation strategies differentiate between the process, the group process, and the end product. So you want to make sure that we have both of those represented so that both of them are valued by the students. Also ensure that you have a way to monitor group interactions, so monitoring the process. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're in every synchronous session your, your group set up um, or you know, that you have to have them meet during a synchronous class and then be in breakout rooms and you pop around. Um, but how can you monitor group interactions? Do you have maybe a, a group meeting worksheet that they have to fill out or, you know, what would that look like for you so that you can make sure that you're monitoring what's going on, that they're making progress, that they're engaged in the process. Also ensure that you provide clear grading rubrics at the start of the process to guide students group collaboration. So how are they going to be assessed? Um, what are the criteria for that assessment? Make sure that that's clear to students from the start before they get started. And then finally, also include self and peer evaluations in the process to monitor individual involvement and increase in accountability. And that may also help you, as it does me, differentiate between grades for individual members of a group based on their participation. So when I do group uh, work in my classes, um, one particular assignment um, is a, a presentation assignment, group presentation, um, peer instruction. And they have to, their classmates fill out um, a, a rubric while they're presenting um, that grades them on criteria. Uh, so they're getting a grade on that, the product there. Um, and then the process, they reflect on that themselves. They write a reflection and then they evaluate themselves, do a self-evaluation and a peer evaluation uh, of their group members and give justifications for those so that I get some feedback on why they think they deserve a certain grade, why they think each group member deserves a certain grade, and some narrative to go along with that so that I can kind of monitor those situations and make sure that everybody gets a grade that they deserve. So they do get uh, their uh, group grade on the process and that's averaged out with their grade on the product from the rest of their classmates. All right, so just briefly on group structures. Um, and I've mentioned, you know, smaller groups typically work better, uh, maybe four, maybe five members. Um, it's not uncommon in a larger group for some members to contribute less than others. I'd say, you know, three to five members. Um, and when I've done, oh, did somebody start talking or was that just my feedback? Sorry, microphone feedback. Um, so it's not uncommon, as I was saying, in larger groups for some members to contribute less than others uh, because they can get away with that because there's a lot of more people to pick up the slack. Um, and larger groups might decrease opportunities for participation. Some members might just become passive observers or do the bare minimum. Um, and in general, the, the less skilled or the less proficient the group members are at the assigned activity, the smaller the group should be so that they get the most out of it. Um, I would recommend assigning groups intentionally. So that could be, for example, and this isn't the only way that you can assign groups intentionally, but based on skills or backgrounds. So that helps um, if you know about your students, you know your students well. Um, but that strategy could help minimize the chance that maybe high ability students will gather together or group together and leave others out. Um, it also allows you to create more diverse groups. It creates opportunities for students to work with peers who they otherwise might not have interacted uh, with. So, you know, you can 
look at, um, and this is might be easier with um, with synchronous classes. Maybe you you see who wants to to chat with each other, um, or you know you're looking at your discussion boards and you see that the same people like to comment on each other's posts. Um, so maybe you want to to divide those people up so that they're interacting with other people. Um, so whatever way you think um, is best to assign those groups intentionally um, so that you get the best outcome and that students get the best outcome from that group uh, is probably. So um, now I want to talk about setting up online groups, and that includes technology tools that you might use. Um, and Dan, feel free to chime in because I know uh, if you're interested in, you know, breakout groups, um, Dan is going to be doing a, a workshop on that this month as well. Um, so if you want to want to chime in on anything without giving too much away from your own workshop, Dan, <laughs> um, go right ahead. Um, but one important component of online group work is providing a platform for accountability and peer evaluation. It's important that group members are held accountable for the quality of their contributions, their levels of responsibility, as well as their professionalism in the group setting. Um, peer evaluations provide you with a way to factor those behind closed doors variables into each student's grade. So um, I explained how I use that. I, you know, if the students have, you know, a worksheet that they have to fill out. It's actually kind of like a packet for peer evaluations. Um, they have to reflect on different aspects of of their process in the group uh, work um, and then give themselves, you know, do a self-evaluation, give themselves a grade, selves a grade and a rationale for why they deserve that grade and then do the same for each of the group members. And then, you know, they also reflect on what they would do differently next time, um, you know, how they could have been more effective. Um, but then they also evaluate uh, each other on their presentations. So if they evaluate the other groups as well. So there's all, all of this peer evaluation going on. Um, Blackboard, and we've mentioned this and Dan brought this up, but Blackboard Original Course View groups have more robust group features than Blackboard Ultra groups. Um, this includes a group homepage and options for tools that you can enable within each group's private homepage space. So you can, you know, give them access to their own collaborate room um, within that home page and they would just go to their group home page and they can access it from there and connect with each other there um, <clears throat> without having to create a session for each one of your groups um, it's already done for you in original course view uh, you there's you can enable or disable whatever tools you want them to be able to have there so if you want them to have a group wiki you can do a group wiki, a group discussion board, you know, whatever tools you want them to have within that home page, you can within limit. I mean, it's not all of the tools, of course, but um, you can you can enable tools that you think are going to be useful for the type of group work that you're going to have. Within that group's private space, and that's all set up when you put students into those groups. Uh, Blackboard Ultra groups. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Well, I, I, I just wanted to mention also, you know, although you make those uh, possible tools available in the original course view uh, as group tools, a lot of times uh, students will find their own tools that are outside of Blackboard's universe and they rely on those things and in fact usually when I have a group presentation at the very end of the semester, I will include in that uh, uh, presentation on I'm asking questions what technology uh, technologies that you relied on and a lot of times they maybe will will use uh, the collaborate room maybe once or maybe twice but they usually find another technology so don't be surprised if students do that however you do want to make the options available so that when you do make the the tools when you're creating up the groups and you make those tools available uh, make them know that uh, know that uh, it's they're not limited to what you're making available that they are invited to search out others and and other tools that everyone uh, will agree on using thanks dan that's a good point yeah um so students should work, use you know you want to give them as many tools as possible at their disposal but know that you know they're going to find what works best for them 
Um, and that's really important when we talk about Blackboard Ultra Groups because there's a lot fewer groups features um, for Blackboard Ultra Groups. It doesn't work like original course view groups. It doesn't have the features available in original courses, um, including those group tools um, or the group collaborate sessions. Um, so you might have to work around that in creative ways. So for example, you might create a folder in a discussion board for each group to work in, um, create individual collaborate rooms for, for each group. Um, so you, there's a little bit more work to do with that. They don't have their own homepage in Blackboard Ultra Groups. And um, it, I know it's on the roadmap to do some more things with, with groups in, in Blackboard Ultra, but I'm not sure what the, the timeline is for those tools becoming available and, and whether they're going to be as robust as the original view groups. Um, some other possible technology tools to promote group work. Um, I mentioned discussion boards, just kind of basic. Students can work asynchronously to contribute ideas, provide feedback. Um, discussion boards on Blackboard are nice because they can um, they can type, so they can put text in there. They can share documents, uh, put attachments in there. Um, they can you know upload or share video from Kaltura within their the discussion post. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of things that they can do with it other than just typing in there and maybe make sure that if you want to use discussion boards, you know. Um, that students know what the, the capabilities are so they don't feel limited. Um, and Michelle uh, just posted to the chat that for technology that students want to use that um, she's not familiar with or offering, uh, they ask the student to present the benefits of the technology to the class. That's a great idea. Very good idea. Then everybody learns about it and maybe you put another tool um, in your back pocket. Um, another technology tool that you might use to promote group work, wikis um, are one of the tools available in original course view um, groups. Um, but you can, um, you, students can divide parts of the project, use a wiki to complete their individual parts, put them into a whole group project. Um, wikis are not in ultra course view. So you might want to, if, you, if wikis are like, you really love wikis, there's a ton of free platforms that you can use um, to have your students generate wikis. Um, VoiceThread is another option. Students can create content, comment on, and contribute to their group member submissions there. Um, Collaborate Ultra was mentioned. Uh, in original course view, your, your groups will have their own Collaborate Ultra session in their group homepage. Um, in Ultra, you might need to create a separate Collaborate session for each group. Um, and with collaborate ultra groups can meet synchronously using that room. So if they want to meet face to face, they want to talk things out, um, they can use their collaborate room or you can set up a Zoom or a Teams meeting for them. Um, group journals or blogs. Um, and you can use you can you can do this in Blackboard original of course you I don't think group journals or blogs are available in Ultra course view, I know journals, individual journals are available in, in Ultra. Blogs are not available at all in Ultra course view. Um, but you can use external platforms. There are a lot of blog platforms out there that are free. When I first uh, started teaching uh, college English, I used uh, external, I think I used um, Blogger for my students. I had them keep a blog throughout the semester and they used Blogger. And they shared, we had a, on our course page online on Blackboard, we had a list of all of the links with the students' blogs so that they could read each other's and comment on them as well. Um, and there's, you know, you can use uh, group journals, you can use uh, the uh, O365 resources, uh, those, those apps. There's, there's a ton of apps on there that you could use as journaling or blogging apps as well. Um, speaking of which, the next one, OneDrive or SharePoint, students can share documents and parts of their project and provide feedback. Um, so if they share a Word document, they can use the comments feature to comment on each other's, you know, parts of parts of their um, project. Um, and they can share, use the share features available to the entire NIU community through, through O365. So that's in OneDrive or they can use SharePoint um, for that as well. Um, 
And then social media connections. And I think um, Dan was kind of alluding to this too, but right? students can set up their own communication channels outside of the course. Um, that might make connecting with their group members more convenient or faster so they don't have to log into the course and navigate to their group homepage if they're an original or um, get onto their collaborate session. They might just want to create a Discord channel um, or um, create a you know, instant message each other or DM each other through um, through Instagram. And these are examples that I'm thinking of because my students are doing this. Um, so my online students take it or taking it upon themselves to to just organize this for the entire class so that they could talk outside of class. Um, so it's not just limited to group work. It could just be the whole class wants to connect on social media and that's really fine. I give them that opportunity to connect uh, or to share their social media handles with each other in the first um, synchronous session so that they can create those connections, you know, make friends, have that social com component to the class um, and, and feel more connected to the class by feeling connected to their classmates. And then of course there's just email, the old standby can be used as just a basic means of communication between group members and everybody has email on their phone. So, you know, it'd be easy for them to to just connect with each other in that way too. Or they can exchange phone numbers um, and they can text each other, have a group text. Um, so there's the possibilities are pretty, pretty limitless when it comes to setting up those online groups. Uh, strategy for sharing social media in an async course. You might want to have that be part of um, that might be part of, so I do a, a discussion board, even though, you know, if I have a synchronous sessions and we introduce ourselves there, I still want them to be able to give some more information and maybe read each other's respond to each other. Um, so I have a discussion board that has just kind of intros a little about me. And so that's one place where you could do that. You could have them also, if they want to um, use that to, um, to coordinate that sharing of, of social media. Um, handles and I stay hands off with that social media so I, I want my students you know if they're talking to each other socially um, even if it's about the course like I want them to have that that freedom that privacy you know if they were on campus they'd be meeting up you know to go hang out and eat and they could be complaining about me and I wouldn't know anything about it. So it's kind of the same thing in the online. So, you know, go ahead, complain about the course, complain about me, whatever you need to do. Um, and so I stay away from the social media. So um, I make sure to tell my students, I'm not going to look you up on social media. You can share your handles here. I'm not going to, I'm not gonna get involved in that. So you share that with each other, know that I'm not going to be checking up on it. Um, and then Lynn says a week after groups are assigned, each student needs to turn in a form with certain information, uh, one group name or number, two, the focus of the project, three, group communication platform for the role in the group. So that could be project manager, document manager, researcher, et cetera. And she found that that stopped a lot of the, I've been left behind. I don't know how to get a hold of my group. I don't have a role. I'm the only one doing anyone, anything complaints. Um, that's a great idea. Yeah, make them accountable right from the start. Make sure that they know what they're doing right at the beginning um, and that they communicate that to you so that they don't have have that those those complaints like I didn't I didn't know how to get a hold of my group, so I didn't do anything kind of thing. Or everybody already got together and I wasn't involved and now I don't have anything to do and everything's already been divvied up. So what do I do now? Um, yeah, if a week after they're assigned, they have to turn in that form. They have to give you that information about what their role is, what they're doing, what their group is, how they're contacting their group. Um, then that would be very helpful. Thanks for sharing that, Lynn. Does anyone else have any strategies that they found work for them that they want to share? Yeah, Dan. 
uh, Amanda, in my own group projects, I, I usually use um, VoiceThread uh, for students to report. It's a weekly status report, and every week uh, there is one person who takes on the role as the, uh, the status reporter. They say, this week we worked on this, this, and this. Our intentions are to do what, whatever it happens to be. But uh, I also uh, give the responsibility to other members of the group to comment on that. So it's not just like, well, this is your week, you do it, and and that's it. They have to say, well, you know, which, what what so and so said is is correct, but she may have left out such and such. And so there is still that sense of participation every week. That they have they have something uh, that that they're looking at, something that they're agreeing with, something that they're reporting on, um, as opposed to just one person doing it, where they say, well, I'm not going to look at this until week week three, week four, when it's my turn to do it. That responsibility for weekly status report m rotates. So the next week, somebody else is responsible for that, and they need to be aware of, of who's responsible for what and when. But also that, that uh, there is the expectation that everyone post a comment. And the technology, the, the voice word technology is perfect for doing that because I can look there. I can look to see what somebody has said, and I can post a comment. I can, I can either write something out or I can have a video of myself responding to it or just an audio recording so that there is a sense of even though it's asynchronous, there's a sense of feedback, um, certainly not immediate, but uh, there is feedback and, and accountability. Great. Yeah, I think that's a great um, idea of, you know, having that responsibility shift, but also, you know, if it's not your week, you still have a responsibility to contribute as well. And um, I know you just wrote a blog post on this, um, but they just improved VoiceThread, right? So the, the assignments feature. As a matter um, of fact, there is a workshop in about 10 minutes <laughs> that actually is going to focus There you on. go. So I'm going to be on that one. <laughs> All right. So workshop in 10 minutes. <laughs> so look for the, if you didn't sign up for it, it's too late now, but look for the recording of that workshop then. Now, that's actually being done by VoiceThread, which they may or may not have. If okay. they have a recording, I'll find some place, some way to, to post it for folks. Yeah. And I, I get their emails too. So usually, usually they'll send if they've got a recording, they'll send a notice of that. So I'll, I'll be on the lookout for that too. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle uses Flipgrid for introductions and then students share their availability, organization, et cetera, for group work. And then the class has to watch each video and share whether or not they can work with each student based on the questions answered, research interests, et cetera. Um, and she's wondering if she should switch to VoiceThread. What do you think, Dan? Because I think you've, you've used Flipgrid before, haven't you? As a matter of fact, I have. Michelle, it's interesting you should say that because I did. I, I initially used VoiceThread for having people do their introductions, um, and, then, and then I went to Flipgrid. I flipped. <laughs> went to Flipgrid to have them do that, but I still use VoiceThread for that very reason I just described, which was to do weekly status report uh, for group uh, projects. So I use both technologies. I like Flipgrid because it's an actual you know, video that people are putting out. In VoiceThread, people tend to, to just record their audio. I want people to get a sense of who, who, you know, what people look like because most likely in these classes, they're never going to see each other. Um, and also, I like Flipgrid because you can, you can you know, make comments on each other. Like someone says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm in this class and for this reason. Um, I, I graduated from Burr Ridge High in, 19, in 2000 and, 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 uh, and 19, and somebody else might say, hey, I, went, I graduated the year before, and so you developed a sort of uh, interactivity, the sense of community with, with students, and I think it's easier when people see what they look like when people are talking um, and also have the ability to respond to someone, um, and you, you have that to some degree with VoiceThread as well, but I, I like both. I, I think both are great tools, VoiceThread and Flipgrid. So it sounds like, you know, great in different ways. So you got to figure out what, what you think is going to work best for whatever you want to use it for. Great. Any other, some other people giving props to Flipgrid there too. So a lot of people like them. Um, and let me just uh, put up our, some selected resources and I'll post these also to the chat and I'll send them as well. Um, in my follow-up email, uh, but just a very few selected resources. There are so many resources out there, but I like these ones because in in some of these too, there's links to other resources, so I didn't have to clog up a page with you know illegible, tiny, cramped text of a bunch of resources on one slide. Um, these have have some some links to other resources as well, and some of them are in a series, so you can kind of switch back and forth. Uh, and look at the other parts. 
So um, just we've got about nine minutes left, but you know you can use your microphone or you can post in the chat. And I just want to kind of continue the conversation of if you have any questions, that's great, or if you have contributions as well, so things that have worked for you in group work, um, or things that you've tried out and didn't work in group work, um, you know whatever you want to share, uh, please feel free. Yeah, Dan. Uh, I'm sorry. I uh, I, I, w I was going to be leaving uh, to go into that other um, workshop, but I just wanted to mention that I had used the group um, discussion boards for them posting their weekly status reports. And one of the reasons why I changed to voice was because I, I would see only one person posting. And, and sometimes the person who was supposed to, they were, they were assigned for a particular week forgot or didn't know or whatever and they didn't post and so there'd be a week of where nobody was you know was posting at all so um although i i've used it in the past for a number of years about two years ago i decided to go with voice of yeah with voice thread because it's it's much more i guess ac accountable and you actually see when people are participating and and especially if they now know that they're responsible for uh um, posting something every single week they're more likely to to do that Great, thanks, Dan, and have fun in the uh, the voice thread workshop. Will do. Thank you so much. Enjoy the workshop. Thank you so much, Amanda. Thanks. Uh, okay, so a few questions, a couple questions about Ultra. Um, what are the advantages? That's something that that would be a long conversation about the advantages versus the disadvantages, and we actually have. Um, a resource that I put together um, on our website about the differences between Blackboard Ultra and, and Original Course View. Group work is not an advantage at this point in time. They focused uh, on, for the Ultra rollout, getting something out there quickly that had fewer features, um, and they're working on making it more robust right now. So it's a lot more robust, robust um, than it was when you know we first got hold of it. Um, but you know, there's still a lot of things that that are missing that you might want from um, your original course you use. Um, so original will be going away. Um, the last before the pandemic, I think that there was possibly some talk about it going away after this semester, but pandemic happened. So that's not going to happen probably. Um, and now we're doing a, um, you may have seen communications about this, we're doing uh, an LMS review right now. So they're reviewing Blackboard, um, D2L, and Canvas, uh, and looking, there's there's actually vendor, demonstra vendor demonstrations coming up. So look in your email for information about that because you can go to those demonstrations. I think there's two on each one. Um, you don't need to go to both on each one because they're it's, they're the same. They're just being offered at different times. Um, so if we stick with if the the consensus is to um, to stick with Blackboard, eventually original will will go away. I don't know that there's a timeline for that right now because of the um, the LMS review at this point. Um, and then Gibson it, uh, says, if I set out questions for discussion, they'll quickly discuss in about three minutes and then sit in silence in breakout rooms. Any ideas? Um, uh, have them write down answers, um, maybe. Uh, I do that with my students. So um, I will have them, or, or I kind of slowly give them <laughs> discussion questions. So maybe give them a, a couple of discussion questions send them to the breakout rooms for a few minutes to discuss those, make them write down what each other says, um, and then report that back to the whole class um, when we come back to the main room, uh, and then maybe send them out with a couple more discussion questions. Uh, so, you know, there's ways to kind of maybe break that up a little bit. Yeah, sometimes they prefer the chat rather than turning their mics on. Um, you know, I tend to give let students do, you know, choose whatever way they want to communicate. Um, so if they don't want to use their mics, maybe they, maybe you know, it might be an equity issue. They they might have um, noise around. They're 
learning from home, per perhaps they've got pets and other siblings and parents working from home. So, um, so yeah, so they might not want to turn their mics on. They might need to use the chat in that case, or maybe that's just the way that they feel most comfortable. Um, and then Emily, that's a great idea. Um, have them work on a shared document on OneDrive that you can keep an eye on. And that also might help with that uh, question from the very beginning of the session, and I, I can't remember who it was, but uh, talking about when they go into breakout rooms, it kind of puts a halt to whatever the students are talking about or is kind of an awkward um, process. Uh, and so that might be one way to kind of keep an eye on things without actually going into the breakout rooms. So having that shared document that you had access to and you can kind of have those tabs open for the different groups and see that they're working on things in their groups, that could be a good way um, to monitor without, you know, popping in unexpectedly into a breakout room. All right, any other questions? All right, we've got a couple minutes left here. And thank you for coming. Um, so if you have any other questions, I'll, I'll stick around for a couple minutes. Um, but thanks for attending today's presentation. If you have questions or comments after the fact, feel free to contact me. My email address is right there. Um, or you can contact um, CITL at NIU.edu, CITL at NIU.edu to reach the first available member of my team if you have you know, an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, otherwise, be on the lookout for a post workshop uh, email from me and I will send you those resources that I shared in the chat um, as well as you know maybe some extra resources to um, on facilitating group work online.